What's up, y'all? I'm Renee Montgomery. I'm a former WNBA basketball player here in the U.S. And this is a story of a sportswoman I can't believe I've never heard of, Aura Washington. Like me, she played basketball. She also played tennis and won everything she could. But because she was black, she never got to play in the biggest tournaments. And untold legends, I'm going to give Aura her place in the history books at last. So let's go. Before we start, please note, this episode contains some outdated language that may offend. Love, 15. Saturday, August 23rd, 1947. A couple of years after the end of World War II. A time of growing political change for Black people across the world. In Africa and in the Caribbean, anti-colonial freedom movements are beginning to gain in confidence and strength. And here in the U.S., resistance to anti-Black racism is growing. And on this day, we're at the famed Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, one of America's great Black universities, founded by Booker T. Washington to enlighten and educate future generations of Black Americans. This college is an island of black achievement in the heart of the racially segregated Jim Crow South. And here on the university's clay tennis courts, at the end of a long, hot day, a mixed doubles tennis match is in progress. Four players competing, two teams each of a man and a woman. This is a reconstruction. 15, all. Oh. The prize for this match, the Mixed Doubles Trophy of the American Tennis Association, the ATA, the parent organization for black tennis in the U.S. This is the most prestigious Mixed Doubles prize open to black tennis players at this point. And there's no hiding the fact that all the players in front of us are playing for keeps. Long, intense rallies, like this one, where the upper hand is never quite clear. 30, 15. Or is over there, facing towards us, on the left side of the court. A few things have changed since we last saw her with a tennis racket. She's wearing wire rim glasses to play now. There are touches of gray in her hair. And when she rushes the net, like that, some of the old speed is gone. And why wouldn't it? Our aura's now in her late 40s. It's now more than 20 years since she won her first ATA doubles trophy. Two decades since her reign as the queen of black tennis began. 25 years or more since she had her first tennis classes with Miss Yancey at the YWCA in Philly. A living legend, not an up and comer. Two of the other players in this match weren't even born then. But Aura Washington still here, just one victory away from another trophy, giving it her all in the Alabama sun. Thirty all. Ooh, nice serve, Aura. And those other players on the court today, over there, Aura's doubles partner is George Stewart. Young, handsome, Panamanian born, 23 years old. A hit with the female tennis fans and some of the male ones too. One of the big talents of the new generation. And his future is bright. A few years from now, he'll go on to break the collar bar for black men in tennis, competing in the previously all white US national championship. But on this day in 1947, George and Aura are an established winning partnership. Last year, they took this same mixed doubles prize at the ATA championship at Wilberforce University. Right now, George is doing most of the running on their side of the court, making the most of his greater speed. 40, 30. It's a tight game. And on the near side of the net, it's also a marriage of youth and experience. On our right is Dr. Robert Whirlwind Johnson. Like Aura, we're talking about an elder statesman of the game here, roughly the same age as her, 
He's sometimes called the godfather of tennis by his admirers, a nickname reflecting his work mentoring young black tennis stars. And Dr. Johnson will also go on to play a key behind the scenes role in the desegregation of tennis over the next decade. And whirlwind Johnson's doubles partner, his protege, a teenager from Harlem. Deuce. Go on, Althea. It's kind of cliche, but the old fashioned advice in mixed doubles is to aim your best shots at the female player on the other side. The idea that she is likely to be the physically weaker player with a slower return. If Aura and George were thinking this at the start of the match, they've changed their minds now. This teenager from Harlem is no beginner. In fact, she's a player so talented, Johnson decided to devote the next decade of his life to developing her talents. Last year, he moved her into his own family home so she could receive daily tennis tuition. She's already one of the most formidable players in the country. Right now, Aura is facing off against the great Althea Gibson. Advantage, Johnson Gibson. So far, it's been a brutal, bitter match. One that has gone back and forth. Or and George won the first set six to four. Then Althea and Warwin Johnson found focus, taking the second three to six. Deuce. And now in this final set, Aura must know that this could be her last chance at a trophy. That this could be one of the final years where she still has what it takes to face down the 20-somethings and teenagers and win. And, of course, that's the question every older athlete must one day face. Can your years of experience, your discipline, your mental strength, your history, can all of that balance out the fact that your body is aging every day? For Aura, here on the clay course at Tuskegee, as the sweat drips into her eyes, this set will answer that question. Advantage Stewart, Washington. From BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service, this is Untold Legends Aura. I'm Renee Montgomery, former pro basketball player, now co-owner of the Atlanta Dream women's basketball team. Episode 6, Defending Her Throne. Aura Washington loses? New York Age, August 29th, 1936. There are always early signs. The very first sign of a crack in Aura's tennis game comes in 1936, a full 11 years before that doubles match at Tuskegee. So, at this point, she seems unstoppable. She's won the Women's Singles Championship an unprecedented seven years in a row. And when the ATA releases their annual yearbook, it has a cartoon sketch of Aura surrounded by a pile of trophies. So many that some are tipping over. The Queen of Black Tennis. So you can understand why Aura Washington loses is a sports writer's idea of a shocking headline at this time. After a reign of seven years, since Broadentown, New Jersey in 1929, Miss Aura Washington, the Philadelphia perennial, was dethroned of her women's single title. And the challenger? This is personal. Her old friend and doubles partner, Lula or Lulu Ballard. The same Lula who maybe first introduces Aura to basketball and who we talked about in episode four. The same Lula who invites Aura around for meals at the family home in Germantown in Philly on Sundays. Miss Ballard fought a brilliant match to bring down the champion in straight sets. This Lula Ballard and Aura Washington was supposed to be very good friends, but Lulu said that she always felt that she could beat her. Art Carrington, former tennis champion and tennis historian. That's the way sports is. You know, they were best friends. It's like Serena and Venus. One is going to conquer the other. Isn't that amazing how <laughs> stuff is when you play an individual sport like that? The first set was a really close one, but it appeared that the defender was tired in the second. 
By this point, Aura and Lula have been doubles partners for more than a decade, taking trophies together as a team from 1925 onwards. Playing that closely with someone, you can't hide any weaknesses in your game. No one knows Aura on the court better than Lula. And Lula may still have wanted payback for something else. You see, Lula Ballard used to be the women's single champion herself before Aura took her crown. Miss Ballard then fought like a tiger to run off four games in a row. They said that Lula Ballard supposedly lost five pounds during this match. Her and Or Washington battled it out. It's a long game. Lula wins the first set, and then it looks like Aura will take the second. As an afterthought, it might be that the 102 degrees heat took its toll. It appeared that the defender was tired in the second set. But steadily, slowly, in the summer heat, Lula wears her friend and partner down. Dehydration, heat exhaustion, heat stroke. She's breaking her. And Lula Ballard is serious on that day in 1936. The second set was a different story. The pep and vim of Miss Washington of former years had vanished. The new champion came through. The score was 6-1. The new champion. That's Lula. It's the first time Aura has lost an ATA title match. After the match, a medic diagnoses Aura with sunstroke and reportedly recommends she retire. If she agrees, that would be the end of her career. And at 38, that's not an unusual age to retire. She has a lot to be proud of. But that's not our Aura. Next year, she is back takes on Lula again and reclaims the women's singles title. But that reputation as the undefeated, undefeatable Miss Washington is gone. And maybe she too feels she's lost some of the pep and vim of former years too. In fact, we have a rare direct quote from Aura about this. She tells the Baltimore Afro-American newspaper that, It does not pay to be national champion too long. It's the struggle to be one that counts. Once you've arrived, everybody wants to take it away from you. You know, that hits hard, but it's true. I've seen it myself in the teams i played for. Where do you go next when you've reached the top? Aura decides to keep entering doubles competitions with Lula, but she officially announces her retirement from singles tennis at the ATA. Aura, out. Pamela Grundy. She was getting older. But she wins again in 37 and may have just decided I'm going out on top. So she stops. But then in 38, there's this new star, Flora Lomax, who is everything in terms of femininity that Aura was not. Afro-American, August 5th, 1939. Fashion interests on the court centered on Flora Lomax's streamlined pleated shorts, which were simply perfect. I guess I am a dreamer. She said Monday with her familiar and engaging smile. She is brimful of personality. You know, she dresses up, she's married, she wears cute clothes, she's from a well-off family. She hobnobs with Joe Lewis and these stars. Her easy movements about the court prove she is a dancer too. There seems to have been some, you know, talk about who was really better and that maybe Aura had retired in order not to have to play. Flora. Flora Lomax taunts Aura in the press, telling tennis fans that she's angry Aura has escaped playing her, like Aura's running scared. Remember, this Mrs. Lomax is brimful of personality. Well, Aura's not having that. Retirement canceled. A date is scheduled. Aura is seen back on the practice course at the Philadelphia YWCA, ready to settle what people call the Aura Flora feud. The papers love it, of course. New York Age, July 22nd, 1939. Miss Washington really will be in a war. She'll wonder what's happening, when, and if she matches, pound for pound, with the young ace, Flora Lomax. Draw up a chair, fellows. Actions speak louder than words. She unretires for one tournament, She goes to this tournament. 
This is a key moment in black tennis and everyone knows it. Either Miss Washington defends her crown or the start of a new Flora Lomax era begins. Afro-American, August 5th, 1939. Aura beats Flora in tennis feud. Match goes three sets. She beats Flora and then she retires again. So she did want to prove that she was still the best, even if she wasn't competing. And to be fair to Lomax, she didn't try to hide her defeat in the feud. She told Baltimore's Afro-American newspaper, I suppose I just lost my head. I was beaten, so I can't be so good after all. And on this occasion, we do know what Aura thought about this game. She also spoke to the reporter at the Baltimore Afro-American. Certain people said certain things last year. They said Aura was not so good anymore. I hadn't planned to enter singles this year, but I just had to go up Buffalo to prove somebody was wrong. And I love the quote, and one of the ones that I really think that probably Aura's personality comes through. I feel like I hear Aura in that. Of course, reality doesn't always follow exactly the story we want to hear. Aura did enter another singles competition a few months later, but was eliminated in the early rounds. After this, Aura does go into retirement for tennis singles matches for real, although she does keep playing in doubles matches, including on that day in 1947 at Tuskegee College. But something much stranger happens to Aura's basketball career. She doesn't age out of the game. The game itself changes around her. Around the time Aura loses that grueling heat stroke tennis duel against Lula Ballard, the Philadelphia Tribune's basketball team are reaching a new peak of success. Trip Girls grab Thriller. February 19th, Otto Briggs' national champion Tribune Girls pulled off a storybook triumph against the Atlantic City Legionnaires. The Tribunes now have a system in place, and it's working. Aura is team captain and plays center. The sports writers on the Philadelphia Tribune ensure publicity through detailed coverage of Trib's games. And as a captain of the Tribunes, Aura has mastered the art of leading a group of players on the court. Not easy for someone with a solo sport background like tennis. It's now a team that works as a team. In terms of public profile, Aura is as close to being a sports star as Black women can be at this time. But as the 30s continue, women's basketball is changing. Tom Jabel again. What happens in women's basketball, the white middle class colleges go away from competitive play to more participation play. Physical education for white women in schools and colleges is moving away from sports with a clear winner, competitive sports, towards general exercise routines done as a group, what's known as participation play. And you have sports days and play days, and it's more of a social function than a competitive activity. Fighting your way through the opposition until you finally hit the shot that wins the game. Well, that sounds a bit competitive, doesn't it? Not a very ladylike activity. The first step in this new mood is to reinforce different rules for men and women so that women in white colleges only learn a more gentle version of the game. When Aura begins her career in the 20s, black women's colleges generally still play basketball by men's rules, the fast, competitive, physical version of the game. That resulted in a whole generation of aggressive, highly competitive Black women's teams across America who were hugely successful in the game. Teams playing at the very highest level. The same teams Aura plays with and against covered every week in the pages of the Philadelphia Tribune. But 10 years later, the wind is blowing in a different direction. Some of the black colleges, they were playing men's rules. But as time went on, they adopted the women's rules. So they went away from competition to uh, participation. It's hard to prove cause and effect, but it may be that the pipeline of talented new players begins to dry up because of this. Fewer black women with a strong background in competitive basketball. And as a result, basketball begins to be seen more and more as a man's sport encouraging fewer women to take it seriously, 
a feedback loop. Early in Orr's career, when women's basketball was at its height, coverage of the women's game often takes up a fifth to a third of the general sports pages in the Philadelphia Tribune. By the 1940s, it had reduced to a trickle. As a former basketball player myself and the co-owner of a women's basketball team now, it's kind of heartbreaking to see the dynamic play out during Orr's career. And even at the time, people were beginning to comment on the problem. This editorial appeared in the Tribune in 1935. Basketball to the dogs? Basketball's dead. What's wrong with basketball? Philadelphia Tribune, February 7th, 1935. The piece is devoted to the problems in both the men's game and the women's, but it touches on many of the same issues. Basketball has gone into a decline in popularity. Locally, there are now no teams with the prestige and backing to arouse the interest that the past teams did. These and other reasons are contributing factors to the demise of basketball as a popular game in these parts. You can see some of this in photos of the Tribs over time. In pictures from the early days, Orr is roughly the age of the rest of the team. She fits in, but that gradually stops being the case. Here's an example. I've got a 1938 team photo in front of me, black and white, with the players proudly lined up in their uniform, each with Tribune written across their shirts. But there's no denying that Aura now stands out from the much younger players around her. She's probably around 40 at this time, and everyone else is about half that age. And the Trib's opponents are usually college students. Perhaps one reason she's still competing and still leading the team is that new players of her caliber aren't appearing anymore. No one has stepped up to replace her because no one can. And Orr is still performing on the court. In one game in 1938 in Atlantic City, her scoring in the final five minutes saves the Tribs from defeat. But it's possible she is also becoming tired of the old routines with the Tribunes. In the early 1940s, more and more women's basketball teams began closing. The ecosystem of elite women's teams that has sustained Aura's career is disappearing. Aura played with the Tribunes from 1932 to 1942. And in 1942, she was 43 or 44, depending on which year you use. And she announces a retirement. I guess she felt she was getting in her 40s. She was having a hard time to to keep up with people 20 years younger. An injury in the final game sparks the decision. She was kicked in the stomach. It took place in a match against another Black women's team, and Aura says it was a deliberate attack by the opposing side. This is one of the rare occasions where Aura speaks to the press. And in it, she sounds sad and disappointed, but not defeated. She told the Baltimore Afro-American, It seems that in colored sports, the first thought is to get the champion out of the way. Other races play faster and fairer. Soon after Aura leaves, the Tribune's team closes down. Aura's departure is only one of the reasons. It'll be two generations more before women's basketball begins to revive again. And I think I still see that difference today. Women's basketball remains under the shadow of men's in so many ways. Fame of players, media coverage, financial rewards for players. It's not that things are all bad, but we still have a long way to go. But five years after the closure of the Tribune's basketball team, eight years after she beat Flora Lomax, Aura is still competing. She's now around 49 years old. You know, for some athletes, retirement doesn't come easy. And today, at the end of a long day on the tennis court at Tuskegee, in front of the cream of the black tennis world, the old aura might be back again. Oh. So far, Aura and George Stewart have held their own against whirlwind Johnson and Harlem's teenage prodigy, Althea Gibson. Both sides have won a set so far. But in this final set, it's proven to be a question of stamina and endurance, resilience. Qualities Aura has found within herself again and again, on the court and off. Match point. All those years of practice, the setbacks and comebacks. 
the heart to shrug off adversity, injustice, prejudice, and find focus. And guess what? On this day, for the last time, she does find a way to victory. Aura and George Stewart take the mixed doubles prize for the ATA Championship of 1947. Game, set, and match. Aura's final prize in tennis or basketball. She did take one out Thea and whirlwind again the next year, but that time she wasn't so lucky. So let's stay with Aura in this moment. Her last taste of victory. Her last moment on a podium. Here in Tuskegee, maybe she knows this might be the last time she holds a cup high in front of a crowd. Let's let her enjoy it. Next time, in our last episode, we explore the mystery of what happens next. How did one of the most famous athletes in the black community disappear so completely from our memory? And is there anyone still alive who can still answer the question, who was Aura Washington? Untold Legends is a Stance Studios production for BBC Sounds and the BBC World Service. And I'm your host, Renee Montgomery. Our cast were Cameron Williams, Alex James, Serena Grace, and Joy Vandervoort Cobb. Before you go, I want you to be a part of our Aura squad. We're searching for even more information about Aura. Maybe you know somebody who met Aura, or maybe you know something, anything, that would help us further piece together her life story. Tell us. You can get in touch by visiting bbcworldservice.com slash untoldlegends.